Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I know it's the first of the day. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, evolving code um, and more generally about how uh, technology is changing the type of work we do and what that might mean for us, um, both as individuals um, and as a society at large. Um, so briefly then, uh, who am I? Um, so my name's Emma, I am a senior software engineer and team lead at a company called CMR Surgical. Uh, we're developing a next generation platform for uh, surgical robotics, uh, trying to make uh, keyhole surgery more universally accessible um, and available to all. Um, that's not actually to do with the talk, although I'm going to talk about robots a lot. Um, I actually first gave this talk before I even started working here. Um, so where does the talk come from? Um, so there is uh, a local developer group uh, where I live called the Cambridge Program and Study Group, uh, where we meet up and we uh, study topics in computer science together. And a couple of years ago, uh, we were looking at machine learning, and we studied a range of different um, techniques, uh, one of which was uh, genetic algorithms, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a bit. Um, but basically, I ended up using these to uh, evolve some code. So uh, you provide a description of what you'd like your program to do, and uh, you go away and you generate that code rather than have to have a human write it. Um, so that was really cool, was my first impression of having achieved that. Um, it was awesome. Um, my second impression was, ah, uh, what have I just done for my job security? Um, I make a living from writing software, as I'm sure many of you do. Uh, it allows me to do useful things, like pay my rent or buy food to eat. Uh, what's it going to mean for me if a computer can just go away and write that code and I'm not needed? Because um, if we think about it, um, over the course of human history, uh, our lives have massively changed, and the type of work that we do has drastically changed through uh, advances in technology. So it used to be that most people uh, worked in agriculture. We were, we were out in fields, sowing seeds, harvesting crops. Um, it was a pretty full-time job to ensure that we all had enough food to eat. Um, but then we invented uh, tools. Um, we, we increasingly automated uh, aspects of that work, and eventually ended up with things like this. Um, now, a single human can go away and produce a vast amount of food, not just for themselves, and it frees the rest of us up to specialize in other areas. This is quite useful. It means that some people can go and build bridges or be doctors. Um, more recently, though, uh, perhaps some of the changes in technology have been slightly more controversial in terms of uh, displacing people from jobs. So you used to, say, uh, walk into a supermarket and uh, there were people at the checkouts, or you went to an airport and there were, there were people checking you in. Uh, now, you're equally likely to walk in and see a, see a line of these. But you might think, OK, um, but that's quite sort of repetitive tasks, so repeatedly scanning barcodes, that sort of stuff. Uh, sort of more in-depth, involved, skilled work, um, that, that won't be as easy to automate. Um, but actually, what we're seeing is increasingly those sort of tasks are coming into the firing line as well. So if we look back a few years then, um, IBM created this. Uh, this is Watson, IBM's supercomputer. Uh, they originally created this to compete at a US quiz show called Jeopardy, uh, which, if you haven't heard of it, uh, is sort of the inverse of a normal quiz. So rather than asking people questions and expecting to know the answers, um, you tell them the answer and you ask them, what was the question? So to succeed at that, you need to be able to do a few different things. First of all, you need to understand words that are said to you. You need to be able to understand that they're not just individual words, but they, they go together to make a phrase or a sentence and be able to understand that, uh, put things in context. You need to have some general knowledge to draw on to come up with what, what the question might have been. Um, you need to be able to maybe make jumps between concepts or, or think laterally about things and maybe abstractly too. Um, and these are all the sorts of things that we might think that humans would be better at than a machine. But sure enough, uh, IBM managed to get Watson to a level where it could not only successfully compete at Jeopardy, uh, but it was beating not just humans, but human champions. And how they did that was a mixture of some natural language processing, so that they, it would understand the questions posed to it, uh, a huge database uh, populated with a, a vast amount of data um, parsed and collected from the internet, some data mining, so that they could efficiently get to the bits of information they wanted, um, and, and some machine learning to sort of iteratively um, train this so it came up with better and better solutions until it was um, the finished product. What makes Watson particularly interesting to me is not the fact that it was able to win at a quiz show called Jeopardy, um, because that's sort of old news at this point. We, we're used to seeing um, a machine has beat humans at chess, a machine has beat humans at Go. 
Um, what makes this interesting to me is the applications that they've put it to since. So there's lots of real-world problems where you've got a lot of data um, and you need to go and parse it to come up with some, um, some, some thing that you're interested in. So uh, one example of that and where Watson has been used uh, is diagnostic medicine. So uh, there you have a huge volume of data. You've got all of your existing medical knowledge, so the kinds of things you might find in these massive medical textbooks that only cover the very basics. Um, you've got um, new journal articles being published all the time, or research papers. Uh, new clinical trials and studies being published all the time. You have records for an individual patient, their medical history, uh, perhaps the history of their immediate family, or um, likely sort of statistical outcomes for people from a similar demographic group. This is a huge amount of data that a human doctor can't possibly hope to keep up with. Um, at best, maybe they read a journal paper or two a week alongside their job, and they've certainly forgotten the one that they read 10 years ago. Whereas Watson um, can keep up with this data, and it doesn't forget things once it's learned them. And that means that it can potentially um, come up with a more accurate uh, diagnosis, particularly for a rare condition that a doctor may not have ever seen before in their career. So doctors then, highly skilled professionals, potentially at least some aspect of their work, this now can do better. And there are other areas as well. So um, legal work, again, huge volumes of data, times and times of law, um, lots of uh, documents relating to the, to the individual or the case, um, evidence from sort of uh, previous, previous cases and precedents have been set, sort of loopholes to be analysed. Um, preparing some casework for a trial or, or some legal advice to give to someone is a very time-consuming process, and that makes it quite expensive. Whereas what IBM have been able to do with Watson um, is use it uh, to provide a sort of legal advice as a service, where Watson's sitting there at the back end, and you have a, an internet chatbot out front for the user to interact with, and this has enabled people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford legal advice um, to, to get some sort of quick advice on what they want. Um, now, that's probably not going to replace lawyers. It's not going to be that tailored to them, um, but it's certainly um, doing some aspects of that job. You might use it, say, in the classroom. Um, it, with its natural language processing ability, it can understand a question that a student asks and come back to them with the answer. If you, you're struggling to recruit enough teachers, and this is a way of, of kind of improving that sort of teacher to student ratio and, and get everyone more individual attention. So, doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, people we think of as very highly skilled professionals then. Uh, now, with some, at least some aspects of their job, uh, this can do as well, if not better than them. So, what about software developers then? Um, what about, what about our, our jobs? So you might think, well, hopefully we're needed to write the code that this sort of technology uses, so we're okay. Uh, but as I was saying, it's looking at ways in which you uh, could uh, generate that code rather than having to have a human write it. So one approach you can take to that um, is genetic algorithms then. Um, so a genetic algorithm is a guided random search algorithm, uh, by which I mean, as opposed to, say, a systematic search where you've got all your data uh, in order, and you, not in order, but in a big line, and you start at one end and you keep looking through until you find the thing you're looking for, uh, which will get there, and it's simple, simple to reason about, but it might take an impossibly long time if you've got a large amount of data. Um, or a random search where you say, I'm going to look over here. Is it there? Nope. Uh, over here? Nope. Over there again? Nope, still not there. Um, which, which uh, is one way of looking for a large data set, but again, it might take some time. Uh, a guided random search is you pick a random point to look at, and then based on what you find there, you decide where to look next. So say I look over here, and the thing I find looks nothing like what I'm looking for, then I'm going to go, well, let's try all the way over there instead. Uh, or if the thing I find here is quite close, then I go, well, I'll look, I'll look in the vicinity. Um, and that only works uh, with data sets that are in some way uh, sorted so that they're, they're continuous, at least around the points of interest. So um, say you've got um, like a contour thing on a map where you've kind of got things that go like this, and you can tell if you've got a point here that the points next to it will be kind of similar. You're not going to have a sudden, sudden jump. And that allows you to infer things of what you found there and what will be in, around it. And in particular, a genetic algorithm is a uh, guided random search algorithm which takes inspiration from biology, um, specifically from evolution, where we have this idea of natural selection and, and survival of the fittest. So if you've got some uh, trait that makes you uh, more likely to survive, say you're 
quick at running away from tigers or something like that, then you're more likely to live long enough to pass on your genes to the next generation, and therefore, over time, uh, those sort of beneficial traits uh, get selected for and become more prevalent in that population. So how on earth does that relate to um, an algorithm, then? Um, so if we take an example of, say, uh, evolving a string, so not programs just yet, just, just a string. Say I want to get one that contains the title of this talk. What I would do is I would first of all generate a whole population of random strings, um, so all different lengths, different characters, just completely random strings. Then I'm going to look through and evaluate those, those individuals and assign them a fitness score. Um, this point is where my uh, analogy of evolution has somewhat completely gone out of the window, um, because in nature there is no end goal in mind, whereas here we are artificially constructing a fitness function to steer our algorithm to converge on the solution that we're looking for. So say I might say, well, um, I'm going to reward strings that are uh, the same length as what I'm looking for, or similar, uh, that have the same characters, um, that have those characters in the right places. So we will, we will score uh, all of these uh, individual strings with a fitness score, and then we're going to select some to survive. So naively, simplest thing I can do, I'm going to put all of those strings in, in order of fitness, and I'm just going to take the top half. I'm going to throw the other half away and say, this top half has survived to, to reproduce and pass on their genes. Um, I then have a crossover step. So this is analogous to um, you getting half your chromosomes from each parent. So again, simplest thing we can do, first half of one string, second half of the other, sticking together. Um, we then have, uh, similarly to how you get new characteristics introduced into the gene pool by uh, random mutations in, in genes, we're going to have a sort of mutation step where for those child strings that we've created, we're going to randomly pick a character and swap it out for a different one. I'm then going to look at the population that I've got and decide, um, does this contain the string that I was looking for? If so, uh, great, I can stop. If not, I'm just going to go back around. I'm going to evaluate it again, uh, continually do this kind of crossover step. So generation after generation, it evolves towards the thing that I'm, I'm looking for. So let's give that a go, then. Um, let's see. Text a bit bigger. Um, so what we're going to see when I run this um, is that for each generation, we're going to print out some statistics about that generation. So we're going to have uh, the average fitness score, uh, the range of fit schools that we've got, and uh, also going to print out the best string that I've, that I've got so far. Um, so to start with, that's probably going to be a string of around about the right length, because in a, in a group of completely random strings, something about the right length is probably our best bet. So over time, uh, hopefully we'll get the spaces in the right place, we'll see some features emerging, um, characters lined up, and we've got to our, our talk title. Um, so that's well and good, um, but to be honest, evolving strings isn't particularly interesting. Uh, it would have been much quicker for me to just write that string down, um, and indeed I had to do that in order to define the fitness function anyway. Um, so what about evolving programs? Um, so code is a bit more complicated um, than just strings, um, particularly before I could just dump a load of random characters to make some random strings. Um, they might not have looked anything like the strings that I was trying to get to, but they were still strings. Uh, whereas if I just dump a load of random characters into a file, the odds that that's any kind of runnable code uh, in, in Python or in C or any other language that I want, it's going to be pretty slim. There's all sorts of rules about um, structure and syntax and, and things that logically don't make any sense to do. Um, so how am I going to generate valid programs? So you might say, well, OK, um, let's do something with templates. I'm going to make a block that looks um, sort of like a for loop, and it's going to like, fill in the blanks for the variable bits. And I'll make another block that looks like an if statement, similarly fill in the blanks. And um, I'll let people randomly sort of mix these blocks and stick them together. And fair enough, you will um, generate some valid start programs with that. Um, but when you start to do the crossover steps, the mutation steps, you're very quickly going to get to something that's no longer valid and won't run. So you might go, OK, um, let's, um, I don't know, I'll make my own language. It's going to consist of really just some simple symbols, and you'll be allowed to combine them in any order that you like. 
What's probably going to happen there is that you're going to unintentionally uh, limit what it is that you can uh, write in that language. So we want to be able to evolve code uh, that could do anything we could um, theoretically write some code ourselves to do. So in order for that to be the case, we need uh, the language that we are evolving the code in um, to be something called Turing complete. So uh, briefly, what do I mean by that? Um, so Alan Turing, very uh, famous uh, mathematician and computer scientist, um, he did a lot of uh, work on the theory of computation, um, and in particular on the idea of reprogramming machines. So um, you don't just program it once and then it always does that thing, you can reprogram it and have it doing something else. And he came up with a mathematical model to help him reason about that. Um, and that model was called, called a Turing machine. Uh, and here we have a sort of mechanical uh, build of one. Um, and what this is, is uh, it's an infinitely long piece of tape uh, divided up into a series of cells. Um, and you have an arrow which points at the cell that you're currently looking at. And in that cell, you can put a symbol in, you can read out the value of the symbol, or you can change the symbol in that cell. You can also move your arrow up and down the tape to point at a different cell. That, I that is it. Uh, that's the entire machine. And yet you can uh, show mathematically uh, that anything that it is possible to compute, and, and not everything is, there are, there are some problems in uh, computer science, like the halting problem, um, but if it's possible to compute, you can um, do so on this machine. And when we say a language is Turing complete, it just means that it can be used to simulate one of these machines. Uh, which means if it can use to simulate a machine which can compute anything that's computable, then you can write code in that language to do anything you like if it's theoretically possible that it can be done. So those are our requirements then. We need an incredibly uh, syntactically simple language, uh, yet which is Turing complete. Uh, so what, what is that language? So at this point, I thought, well, that might already be a solved problem. I'm a software developer, so therefore, I'll Google it rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, and I found this site. Uh, this is uh, Corey Becker's site, primaryobjects.com. Um, it contains a load of really interesting uh, blog posts and articles on various machine learning topics. I uh, highly recommend it uh, if that's the sort of thing you're interested in. Um, and she had, in fact, looked at exactly this problem, i.e., um, evolving code to fulfill um, some, some need. Um, and she'd identified which is a great language to use for that. And this language has only eight characters, um, and it's pretty much just a model of a Turing machine. Now, in the interest of not repeatedly swearing at you for the rest of the talk, um, <laughs> which may happen, I'm sorry if I actually do. Um, I have uh, abbreviated the name, or as math textbooks like to say, left it as an exercise for the reader. Um, so brain F, then, as we'll call it. Um, so this is just a Turing machine, uh, pretty much. Um, so we have the first six symbols um, are, are mainly involved with that. So you've got um, moving the pointer left and right. Um, you've got the plus and minus to uh, change the value that's in the current cell. Um, and then the dot and the comma to do with outputting and inputting symbols from that cell. Where it gets interesting uh, and where the language uh, gets its power and its control flow uh, are these square brackets. Um, so this is what allows us to look in the value at a cell and decide what to do next. Um, so this allows us to go back and loop around again or to continue on. Uh, these are also the only parts of the language of any kind of syntax requirement. Um, so in the normal way that brackets need to match up, so you need to start with the opening one and then end with the closing one, um, we have that requirement on syntax. Um, that's the only syntax requirement. Other than that, you can just uh, dump random characters. So what does a program in Brain F look like then? Um, so this is your standard introductory program um, in most languages. Uh, output hello world to the screen. Um, yeah. <laughs> As you can see, this is quite an esoteric language. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to write code in this. Um, I certainly don't want to debug code written in this. Um, but to a computer, uh, this is just as intelligible as code written in Python or, or whatever language you like. Um, and to us, this is just a string of characters. Um, and we've already looked at, at how we might go and um, generate random strings of characters, how we might cross them over, do the mutation. So we already have techniques that we can reuse. So actually, this is great. 
Um, so let's try then um, and evolve some code. Uh, Run in brain F. Um, due to the wonder of random demos, this is going to be slightly hair raising, but we'll give it a go. Um, so what are we going to try and evolve? Um, so I was going to do Hello World, um, but I realized that making you all sit there and watch that converge was perhaps a little cruel. Um, so I've gone with a slightly abbreviated hi. Um, and we're going to have um, some new problems here that we didn't have when we did the string evolution. Um, so it's possible to have uh, an invalid program. So as I said, very few syntax requirements for NF, just the square brackets. Uh, but it's still, it's still possible to mess it up. Um, we might have a perfectly valid program which just never terminates. Perhaps it contains an infinite loop. Um, so we're going to have to define some cutoff period after which we go, yep, probably not going to terminate. Let's call that a day and time that one out. The other thing that might happen is that the real world isn't actually like perfect theoretical mathematical models. We don't have an infinitely long piece of tape. Our computer that we're running the program on has a finite amount of memory. And we might go off the end of it. So again, we're going to need to spot that error. And for all of those things, what we're going to do is assign uh, that individual a very low fitness score so that we can try and, as quickly as possible, uh, weed out things that just don't run and get to, if not the program we want, at least something that runs and, and we can start evolving. So. Um, so what we're going to see this time when I run this um, is that for each generation, we're again going to print out um, the average fitness score, um, the range of fitness scores, um, and I'm going to print out the brain F code of the individual uh, that's currently got the highest fitness. Additionally, I'm going to print out the output um, of all the programs in that generation. Let's see what happens. So, quite quickly, uh, we get to things uh, that are producing output. And we can see we're actually reasonably close. Um, most of these are sort of two character outputs. Um, and we're even starting to get sort of some of the letters lined up. Um, it's probably going to take quite a lot longer to get to where we want. And, and why is that, given that we got so close so quickly? Um, so the key thing here is that um, no longer, as we have with the string evolution, are the thing that we're evolving and the thing that we're fitness scoring are one and the same. Now, um, we're evolving the brain F code, but we're scoring the fitness of the output. So you might have output that's only one character off, um, but maybe your code is stuck in some really awkward loop that's really difficult to get out of. And any mutation that gets it out of that initially produces worse output, and so it's going to be selected out. And so to counter that, uh, we're going to need to change how, we're, how our algorithm works a bit. Um, so for instance, in the mutation step, uh, we need to have ability to make bigger jumps, bigger mutations. So instead of just replacing a single character, we might say go over the whole string and have some probability of replacing each one. Or we might add other uh, mutation types, so uh, inserting characters, deleting them. For our selection, if we just take the top half, um, actually that's a bit too elitist. We're going to really quickly dive towards something that looks promising to the start, um, ignoring something going off in that direction, which looks worse now, but actually is heading towards the actual solution. So we're going to change to something called roulette wheel selection, uh, where we basically have a big circle um, divided into a wedge for each of the individuals in the population. That wedge is going to be bigger if the individual has a higher fitness score. And then we're going to spin a spinner on it, um, and it's going to land probably more likely to land on a, an individual with high fitness, and so they're more likely to make it through. But there's still some chance of the others getting in as well. Uh, nonetheless, it's going to take a while. Um, Yep. Uh, <laughs> you're probably going to notice uh, some things as well. Um, like, it just does things that you wouldn't, a uh, human wouldn't. Like, you've got situations where you've got a load of pluses followed by a load of minuses, and they just cancel each other out. So, um, why would you bother doing that? Um, you might also be thinking that, my goodness, this is taking a long time, and frankly, I write more interesting code for a living than things that just write hi. Uh, I think my job's probably quite safe. Um, Maybe not. Um, <laughs> um, but you can do more interesting things than this. So I mean, I was just doing this for fun. Uh, so I basically stopped here. But um, Corey, who I mentioned earlier, she went on and uh, wrote pro evolved programs that did things like take user inputs and then add those numbers together, or generate the Fibonacci numbers, which I was pretty impressed by. 
Um, you could also take other approaches. So this is um, evolving the, the program code as a string. Uh, you could take the abstract syntax tree and evolve that. Um, or you could say, well, actually, Emma, you only use genetic algorithms because you happen to be studying that at the time. Uh, let's try a neural network instead, or things like that. Um, but you, still, it, it, to me, anyway, looks like right now, at least for the next few years, I'm, I'm maybe OK. Um, so what are the sort of projections, then, for uh, likelihood that um, software development and that sort of job will be uh, replaced by machines. Um, so there are a few uh, predictions being made. Um, one site uh, which captures some of that data is uh, willrobotstakemyjob.com. Um, so this is quite a fun site. It, um, it's uh, based off some uh, paper that was published in 2013, uh, which made some predictions about, uh, for various different uh, professions, what the odds were that those would be um, automated and, and replaced by robots by 2024. Um, so the first thing to note is that 2013 is five years ago, which is quite a long time in tech terms. Um, and also other projections have been made since. Um, they have differing um, sort of predictions, um, depending on what, uh, how they decide to break down the jobs, how they define them, what sort of, if they consider whole jobs or all the tasks that make the jobs up, um, and on what kind of underlying assumptions they make. Um, in 2024, we can go and see which one was better um, for now, um, but we'll just use this one. Um, so what happens if I put some uh, tech jobs into this? Um, computer programmer. 48% chance of automation by 2024, start worrying. Whereas, software developer, totally safe, 4.2%. Um, something about the phrase totally safe, which alarms me far more than start worrying, but that's... Uh, <laughs> um, so what, why is that? Um, why why, why are they come out with such different numbers? Um, so if we go back and look at uh, what definitions they used for these jobs, uh, that might help us help see why. So computer programmers then, uh, according to this, the definition they used, um, they create, modify, and test code that allow computer applications to run. They work from specifications drawn up by software developers, and they may assist software developers um, analyzing user needs and designing the software. Um, so basically, they're, they're doing not something not too dissimilar from what we just looked at. So they're given a requirement specification by someone else, and they're told, I need the code to do this go away and, and generate it. So, so you can see that might have a slightly higher chance of automation than, say, uh, software developers, uh, which is defined as um, develop, create, and modify uh, general computer applications, uh, analyze user needs, uh, and develop software solutions, design software um, for client use um, and with the aim of optimizing uh, efficiency. Uh, may supervise computer programmers, and they work individually or coordinating with others. So we've got tasks in there which we can see why uh, maybe there's less risk of automation right now. So um, working with other people, uh, interacting with users, defining those requirements to start with, and the design. So a bit of insight into why the numbers are different. Um, and so it really depends um, the odds this site gives uh, for a job being automated in terms of what tasks that job uh, is composed of. Um, and what makes a particular task, say, easy or hard to automate? Um, so things that are very repeatable um, uh, are easier to automate. So uh, clocks, for instance, have been sort of chiming on the hour um, without someone going up and hitting a bell with a hammer for quite some time now. That sort of thing is quite um, easy to automate. Um, whereas something more varied and unpredictable is much harder. Um, so say we were to look at self-driving cars, and uh, if we wanted to talk about potential for job loss, then self-driving cars is probably what we should be talking about, because if you think the number of people that are involved in driving vehicles in various forms uh, that could potentially be completely replaced, like all aspects of their job, by those. Um, but we're not quite there yet. And the reason is, it's very different to say, uh, have your self-driving car on your test site, a small area which you've got perfectly mapped out. You understand there aren't other people using that area, other, other vehicles, um, to make that work. Um, and, and, and people have done that. And we have um, the reports, which are mainly automated now, and have um, you know, self-driving cranes lifting things off ships and then putting it onto a self-driving lorry. Um, but it's because that port is closed to the outside world. They know exactly the route map. Um, there's never any other people around or any other vehicles. Whereas uh, the real world roads, um, 
you might have uh, an unannounced uh, route diversion that day, some temporary roadworks. Um, you can have changing weather conditions. You uh, have, uh, you know, the standard thing of a football goes into the road and the kid runs out after it. Um, you have other drivers doing potentially unpredictable things. Um, your, your, your route may not actually bear any resemblance to what the sat-nav says it is. Um, this is all much harder to deal with. Other things that are hard to automate um, involve things which, uh, say, have an element of human interaction. So jobs that require empathizing with someone, um, harder for a machine to do. Um, things that involve creativity. Um, so this is where, at the moment, we quite like to think of ourselves as um, quite separated from machines. Kind of people like to say, well, humans can um, compose sonnets or, or paint a masterpiece of art. Um, I hope that's not the only distinction we're making, because I can't do any of those things. Um, <laughs> but um, we have some advantage in that area for now. Um, computers are making inroads, so um, they have started composing the first original pieces of music, uh, painting first bits of original artwork. Um, but for now, um, creative tasks are, are somewhat harder to automate. Um, so what's key then to the, um, whether a job uh, will be replaced by machines is, is sort of what composition of tasks it has, how many of them are easy to automate versus hard. Like, if all of the tasks involved in that job are easy to automate, then it can be fully replaced by a machine. If only some of them are, uh, then you're in a sort of partial replacement scenario where you're more likely to end up working alongside machines. So perhaps the nature of the work you do changes. So, Looking back then, historically, how many jobs have we previously seen um, completely replaced by machines? So if you go and look at uh, the 1950 US census data, where people say, uh, what, reported what jobs they did, um, you see there are a number of professions which no longer exist. Um, most of these are due to things like uh, technology becoming obsolete. So we don't need telegraph operators anymore, for example. Um, some of them are just demand just isn't there anymore. So uh, who needs a boarding housekeeper these days? Um, but there was one job um, which had been uh, replaced by, because of automation. So I'll give you a minute while I have a drink to see if you can uh, think what you reckon it might be. So, um, congratulations if you guessed correctly. Um, it is elevator operators. Um, so you used to have a manual lever um, that you had to pull to put the brakes on. And it was quite a skilled thing, actually. You need to make the lift stop at the right floor and line up exactly, otherwise you can only get half out. Um, we just don't have a need for these anymore. We, we've just automated lifts. Um, that's not quite true. There's, there's a couple of skyscrapers left in New York uh, with these, I think, more as a tourist attraction. Um, but basically, this, this job just doesn't exist anymore. Um, and it's not um, a new concern, I guess, thinking about um, jobs being replaced by technology. Um, and we maybe want to look back through history and see previous examples to see if we can kind of extrapolate to see uh, whether we think the rate at which jobs being replaced by machines completely might increase or stay the same. Um, what, what previous examples have we had? Um, so this is um, a, sort of a machine for automating uh, production of cloth, so kind of weaving, knitting machine. Uh, this is quite a modern example. As you can see, there's electric lighting in the picture. Um, but the very first um, one of these, its predecessor, uh, was created uh, nearly 500 years ago now um, by a man named William Lee, um, who went to uh, Queen Elizabeth I and asked for a patent. Um, and she shared many of the concerns that people are talking about these days. So she said no to that patent. She said it will um, deprive people of work and replace them. Um, I, I want those people to have a job and, and be able to, to afford things like food. Um, but not having a patent obviously doesn't stop you from deploying this technology. Um, and indeed they did, um, and it was made its way into a number of factories. And actually that concern uh, about losing jobs, it didn't quite play out that way, at least uh, to start with. So what ended up happening um, was they in increased uh, drastically the amount of uh, fabric that one individual worker could produce, because now they were using this machine. And because of that, uh, the cost of it decreased, uh, demand increased, and it kind of balanced out with the fact that each person was producing more, and the number of jobs was actually maintained. That's not to say it wasn't controversial, however. Um, it did have negative effects. So um, 
you now could use these uh, machines with less skill than was required to make these materials before. Um, and because of that, uh, wages were hit, like wages decreased for people. Um, and without sort of unions back then for people to, to go to to kind of counter this, um, th there were riots. Um, you may have heard of the Luddites. Um, I think they've got a slightly unfair reputation in history as they've gone down as um, completely uh, opposed to any new technology. Uh, so what they actually wanted uh, was some regulations around its use. They wanted uh, requirements on, on fair wages for the operators, um, on, on people having to do an apprenticeship before they were deemed as skilled enough to operate it. Um, in order to counter the effects on the wages uh, that they were seeing. Um, so, it's not a new topic of concern then, this kind of uh, what effect will technology have, what, what might the outcomes of that be. Um, and there's a wide range of different predictions and projections at the moment, uh, which I'd like to talk about a bit. Um, but I should say at this point, the talk stops being kind of manufactual and starts being mainly uh, a mixture of different predictions, projections, opinions, and that sort of thing. So um, I think it's important to draw the distinction. Um, I'm going to attempt to prevent a, a sort of balanced view, overview of those, um, and probably, to be honest, ask you more questions uh, than I answer, because I think it's important that we all start thinking about this sort of thing. Um, so what are, then, some positive and negative outlooks that people have on automation? So. Um, the top two here kind of echo what we've just seen in the previous example um, with the Luddites and these weaving machines. Of some people argue, well, actually, automation is good because it will um, increase productivity, decrease costs, increase demand, and actually, you won't lose any jobs because of how that balances out. A lot of people will go, well, look, we've seen that before, and it depresses wages, so it's still a problem. And actually, um, the, the argument about uh, maintaining jobs due to this economic uh, balance uh, only holds if you partially replace uh, the, some tasks for that job. Um, if you can work alongside machines to do your, your work more efficiently, then that can be true. If you're completely replaced, um, then you're in the bottom scenario of just mass unemployment, um, as might happen uh, if we have completely autonomous vehicles. Um, well, some people say, well, you will lose jobs, um, but new jobs will be created. Um, for example, um, probably none of us have grandparents that were data scientists. This one's quite hard to reason about because just trying to think uh, it, about things which by their definition don't exist yet is quite difficult. Uh, but, but new job types will certainly um, come about. Um, but what might happen is that the people that lose um, their jobs aren't necessarily going to be the ones that can pick those jobs up. So there's, there's a, might be a skills gap, retraining needed. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and this may cause some growing inequality. So um, if you've got some people being put out of jobs or on lower wages, and you've got other people that have, happen to be the lucky ones that have the skills for the new jobs appearing and can demand quite a high wage for their services, you're going to have a, a growing gap appearing in society. Another thing that you might think about is, well, hang on, we've got, we've got quite an aging population uh, at the moment. Um, how are we going to uh, help to uh, provide the sort of continued level of health care that we enjoy at the moment. How, how are we going to pay for that? Uh, maybe automation can help boost productivity and help increase the, uh, the amount of economic contribution from each worker. Maybe that, that'll help us. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot of potential different uh, upsides, downsides, ranging from um, extremes of it's going to be an amazing utopia where no one needs to work um, and we'll all enjoy lots of free time to robot apocalypse. Um, most people sit somewhere in between of there'll be a mix of these things all happening at once. Um, so how, how do we as society react to some of these challenges then? Um, we, we're going to need to do something. Um, there's some things we might want to consider. So universal income has been something that's been talked about for a while, um, perhaps gaining um, more traction recently. We've had a recent referendum in Switzerland uh, that was uh, rejected. There was a trial in Finland of how this might work. Um, are we going to need to change our education model? Um, we've got kids starting school now who, by the time they leave school, the jobs that we currently have might not exist anymore. They might need to know how to do new jobs, which we don't even know what they are, let alone what skills they require. Um, and how do we make education more lifelong? Do we need to provide more opportunities for retraining if people might have to change lots of jobs in their lifetime? Um, another suggestion that was put out there, um, I think by Bill Gates, was, well, in the same way that you have income tax at the moment, perhaps we could charge companies a tax on robot productivity to help pay for some of the sort of ideas higher up this list. 
There's probably other things that we might consider that aren't on this list, um, and how, how those would work is, is an interesting question. So, um, at the moment, uh, most people, we, kind of, we need to work, um, so some people argue, therefore, we shouldn't have universal income yet. Um, but then, in the, in the future, maybe we get to a point where it definitely needs to happen. Uh, what happens in the transition period between those two points? Uh, how on earth will we make that work? Um, there are other questions as well. There's moral and legal issues. So we've seen recently a lot in the news about uh, privacy concerns um, as kind of increasing use of um, data collection. Artificial intelligence means um, companies don't know a lot more about us. There are legal questions. So who's responsible if a self-driving car is in an accident? Um, indeed, who writes the algorithm that gets to decide um, you know, does it go in a straight line and hit two people, or does it actively swerve out of the way and choose to hit one? Who gets to pick that? Is it the developer writing it? Is it the company? Uh, is it government, lawyers? Is it all of us? Um, we need to start thinking about these things, and we need not just technical people to be thinking, but, but everyone. Um, so on the subject of questions, uh, if you have any for me, um, I'd be happy to take some. Uh, if you're interested in the code for the uh, demos that were run earlier, uh, it's all on GitHub at that link. Thank you. Twenty-five years ago, in a uh, theory of computation class, I used genetic algorithms to evolve a uh, finite state machine to solve a problem and got in trouble for using up most of the department's computing resources. You've just demonstrated, again, uh, using a, a slightly more complicated Turing machine to write a program. Um, that's not quite right, but you know what I mean. Are we going to get efficient enough at evolving programs to do something functional, something useful to actually replace ourselves, our programmers? Yep. Um, I think potentially, um, as you said, this kind of the increases in um, computer power that we've seen um, have, been, have been extraordinary. Um, so in terms of resources and, and being able to run something in a decent time, I can see that being true. Um, I think there are other aspects of our work that are harder to replace, so the kind of design, the, the talking to users. So um, I'm hopeful that even if computers are writing some of the code, that we will still be needed for sort of the architectural aspects. Um, if not, kind of the low-level implementations once you kind of get to the function and class level. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, when you uh, write a program today, uh, a lot of times you have an IDE help you with a lot of things. So. Part of the automation of writing programs is already happening, but it doesn't use uh, genetic algorithms these days mostly. There are specific algorithms written for the analysis of programs, etc. Um, do you have a, a prediction about how uh, genetic algorithms will get um, um, uh, involved in that, will get um, more um, used in, for, for these things, and how, how the um, balance will be between uh, machine learning and, and uh, other automatic evolution of, of code versus um, pre-written uh, designed uh, elements. Yep. Um, so, um, in terms of genetic algorithms getting more involved in things, I think um, Perhaps not this problem. Um, I, they are massively useful in, in optimization problems. So uh, there's lots of situations in physics and chemistry um, where you've got sort of lots of variables, uh, a, a space which is, it's uh, the polynomial is too complex to solve uh, analytically. Um, so you need to use this kind of optimization approximation techniques. Um, in terms of evolving code, um, I don't know whether it will be genetic algorithms or some other uh, aspect of machine learning. Um, Maybe, maybe neural networks instead, potentially. Um, but I think they will be... Um, it depends where we get to with intelligence and creativity, I think, um, in terms of artificial intelligence. So I if things can start um, designing uh, aspects of work, um, particularly if we get to levels of user interaction and, and being able to converse with machines where they can understand us, then potentially they can start taking over some of those 
um, user requirements gathering bits as well. Um, but I still like to think there's some, some role for us in, in all of that. Cool. All right, thank you very much. Okay, if there are